There we go. And I shall mute everybody. And off we go. Okay, and I'm just, I'm just going to share a, a file. Uh, um, so if you bear with me. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, uh, documents. Um, this is a bit embarrassing because uh, it's uh, <laughs> it's not not allowing me to share the uh, share the file. So if you can uh, bear with me. If you share your desktop and then go into it normally, that usually works. Okay. Okay, documents. Uh, documents. Documents. Oh. Okay, is that working? No. Can you see anything? You, but not, not, not any files. No, nothing. Yeah. Um, Granville, do you want to send me the, the is it a PowerPoint? Because I can show the PowerPoint and you can talk and then just say change the slide. That's, that's a way of doing okay, it. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. Just bear with me. Um, Into my Gmail. Yeah. Must have found all this preparation very, very stressful. Yeah, um, it's not. It's not easy. Um, so I need to go into my scent, and there's a PowerPoint there. And I need to forward it mm -hmm. to. Can you just read out your email address, please? Mark? MWJ1 at liverpool.ac.uk. Send. Okay, that's on its way now. Okay. So if I, if I go back to. Um, can, you, can you all still see me now? Yeah, you've kind of frozen. So I don't know if that's because you shared the screen. Um, hmm. uh, okay, that's me. Yeah, that's you. That's it. Okay. So uh, what, whilst uh, Mark's getting the PowerPoint, um, I might as well do a little bit, of, little bit of the history. Um, yeah. Uh, the title of the presentation is an, an elementary theory of periodic numbers, um, and it really is elementary. Um, but what I need to do is to essentially run through my bi-entropy stuff in as summary form as I can, just to put it in context and show you why we're doing it. Um, I invented this thing called bi-entropy uh, seven or eight years ago um, because I was trying to find a way of making money on the stock market, looking at um, analyzing the upticks and downticks of uh, various stock prices and uh, it just popped out popped out of the ether um, and then ended up writing a full paper which I, I gave at uh, AMPA you know, half a dozen years ago um, and I did some very basic work on the, the prime constant so I looked at the order and disorder of the prime constant um, which gave me a, um, a useful result. I was able to show that the prime constant, um, which is a binary string uh, corresponding to whether or not successive primes are or are not, uh, whether the successive natural numbers are or are not uh, prime numbers. So that, that was interesting. But so I had a, a skirmish with bi-entropy and the prime numbers um, you know, seven or eight years ago, and nothing much came of it. Um, but uh, about 18 months ago, um, I 
decided to go and spend an hour looking at the prime numbers and by entropy in more detail and uh, essentially made a, a wonderful empirical discovery. Uh, so I bashed through the uh, em empirical work, um, which was quite hard. Um, and then even harder still was to come up with a, a theory, which uh, I, I believe I've managed to do. So let, let, my, my work's been published uh, in peer-reviewed journal by now. Uh, it, it's been on archive since November 19, and it's been in Entropy magazine since uh, March 20. And I'm pleased to report that uh, I've now got two entries for Bientropy in the OEIS, um, which uh, is uh, uh, quite 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 interesting. Uh, so anyway, uh, if perhaps we move to the first slide. Okay, can you you can see the slides all right? Can you? Uh, yeah, I can. Yeah. Good. Here we go. So um, first, uh, a few words about what we might regard as our intuitive understanding of order and disorder, uh, then straight into Shannon entry, entropy, which I'm sure everyone's heard of, but just a little reminder of what it is. Um, this work on the prime number is utterly dependent, dependent upon the uh, binary derivatives. Uh, and nobody's, uh, based on my searching of the literature, nobody's put together prime numbers, number theory and binary derivatives uh, before um, so I, I, I combined Shannon entropy and binary derivatives to develop this by entropy function, uh, generalize it to try entropy, apply it to the prime numbers, and uh, I'm able to make some fairly robust statements about um, what goes on in the, uh, in the limit. Because although I uh, did my empirical work on 16 bits and 32 bits uh, integers, uh, it, 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 it generalizes uh, brilliant, brilliantly and simply because of the uh, properties of, of the binary derivative, derivative. Okay, thanks, Mark. So um, this is how we, we might understand uh, order and disorder. Um, an 8-bit string, which is all ones, we might regard as being perfectly ordered. Uh, an 8-bit string of all zeros, we might regard as being uh, also perfectly ordered. A string 0101010 is mostly ordered, but there's a, a reversal at the end. Uh, a string 0101010101 is clearly regular, it's not disordered, and in fact it's periodic. And then the next string has a is a periodic string which, where the string has a period of uh, four. It's a repeating 1100. And then uh, uh, the last couple of couple of three st uh, strings, we uh, th there's no obvious pattern, and so the the, the task at the moment uh, is to come up with an, an algorithm uh, to rank the binary strings, a bit, sixteen bit, however many bits, into ascending or descending order and disorder based upon the pattern in their uh, in their digits. So that that's what and that's what bioentropy does. Um, and there are many ways of doing it. Um, there's not just one bi-entropy algorithm. There are essentially many bi-entropy algorithms. Okay, thanks, Mark. And so bi-entropy is based uh, upon Shannon entropy. Uh, and Shannon's, ent Shannon's entropy HP is uh, sim simply uh, a couple of, uh, is based on P, where uh, P is the proportion of ones in the string, uh, and one minus P is the obviously the proportion of zeros in the string. Um, so to compute Shannon entropy, we count up the number of ones in the string, uh, compute a couple of proportions, and take two logarithms and add them together. Very, very simple. And it gives us a, a number between uh, zero and, uh, and one. Or is it 0 and 0 0.5? I might, might, might have made a little mistake there. Um, so a, num a, a number that has a uh, Shannon entropy of 0 um, doesn't have any variety in it. It's all zeros or all ones. And a number that has a string has a Shannon entropy of 0 0.5 has an equal number of zeros and ones within it. Thanks, Mark. Anyone, anyone has any questions at any time, just uh, uh, blurt right in. That's, that's fine. And so um, the inverted U, the, the deep blue line is the um, 
is, is how Shannon entropy varies with variety. And on the x-axis at the bottom, you can see variety running from zero through to one. Um, Shannon entropy, uh, the, uh, the inverted U, is uh, at its greatest in the middle, where it's not where it's uh, uh, yeah, where, it's, where it's one. Um, and what I've what I've done in my my entropy work is I've uh, chosen to take the nth power of uh, Shannon entropy to improve the by entropy's algorithm's sensitivity to uh, deviation from the central measure. So what we're wanting to do is to um, be sensitive to any dis deviation from equi equal numbers of zeros and ones in a string. Uh, thank, thanks, Mark. Um, I, actually, can we just, just go back to that uh, back one, please, Mark? Yeah. Uh, just notice that the when you take the tenth power of the Shannon entropy, the curve is approximately normal. And we'll be uh, adding together uh, lots of uh, lots of normal curves. And adding together lots of normal curves is a well understood thing in uh, mathematics and statistics. Okay, thanks, Mark. Next slide. Yeah, but, but the problem with Shannon, the problem with Shannon entropy is that, is that it mostly ignores any order and disorder in the string. So, if a string is periodic, zero one zero one zero one zero one, um, then it it has the same Shannon entropy as a string such as one zero zero one 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 zero zero because there are the same number of ones and zeros on each of the two strings. But clearly, uh, they are qualitatively different because one string is periodic and the other is not periodic. Um, but note that uh, where a string is all zeros or all ones, uh, Shannon entropy is zero. So the, the Shannon entropy does, in, in and of itself, have some sensitivity to um, periodicity, uh, but it's not terribly sophisticated. Okay, so next slide, please. So, um, uh, Professor Mervyn Nathanson, uh, uh, his first postdoctoral pa paper, I believe, in 1971, uh, was on um, periodicity. Uh, it was was on um, derivatives of binary sequences. Uh, he also also did a, a paper the following year on integrands of binary uh, binary derivatives. Uh, uh, Nathanson defines periodic. Um, as you can see there, um, with a string with, with the period p, um, and he also uses the concept of eventually eventually periodic. So you can see strings that are initially zeros, then become one, uh, then then become zero ones, uh, or a string that starts zero one one and eventually becomes zeros. So he um, uh, he defines notions of period periodicity and does a full theory. Uh, of the uh, properties of uh, binary der derivatives and uh, the notion of periodicity within binary derivatives. And, and, and Nathan, Nathanson's paper is a foundational paper for my work. Uh, without Nathanson's paper, my work uh, would have no substance. Next, next slide, please. So to detect periodicity, uh, we need to use the binary derivative, uh, which is simply the adjacent, taking the exclusive or the adjacent bits of a string uh, to obtain the next derivative. Um, so the first derivative of the string 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 is all ones uh, because uh, every adjacent bit is different. Um, the sixth deriv derivative of the next string is 0, 1. Which you can check for yourselves um, and so on. Uh, so there are, uh, for, for a string of uh, length n, there are n minus 1 derivatives. Uh, and n minus one binary derivatives. Um, and uh, excuse you know, me, what what is your definition of the derivative here? It's the, it's the exclusive or of the adjacent adjacent bits of a string. So um, if you look at a string zero one zero one zero one zero one, uh, starting at the right the right the rightmost per. Oops, sorry. Uh, uh, so start, starting at the rightmost per zero one, uh, those two are different. Uh, so the exclusive or of zero and one is one. So we we write we write the we write the derivative from the right hand edge by tradition. Uh, is that okay, Lou? So it's simply the exclusive or of the adjacent bits. And so when we start with a 
uh, an eight bit string, the first derivative is seven bits long, and the next derivative is six bits long, and so on. And so we end up with a final derivative, uh, which is just uh, of length one. But in the bi in the bi-entropy work, we don't uh, uh, we don't use the uh, last derivative. Thank you. Okay. So next slide, please. Um, and so there are uh, a number of formal properties of binary derivatives, and we only need to use um, a, a few of them. Um, so if, if a derivative of a binary string is periodic with a period p, then the binary string is periodic with a period of p or 2p. Um, if, a, if a binary derivative is all zeros, then the original string has a period of 2 to the power of m for some m, uh, uh, m between 0 and n. Um, if a binary derivative is p periodic, all of the bits of a higher derivative eventually fall to zero. And finally, probably the most important uh, property, um, a string is periodic if and only if one of its, one of its higher derivatives is zero. Uh, that, 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 that property is crucial for our work. So, uh, next slide, please. Now, a, sec a second paper, which appeared in 95 by uh, Davis et al, also provides us with foundational uh, properties, this time statistical of the binary derivative. Uh, so in each case, the qualification is that the bits in the string uh, appear with um, equal numbers of ones and zeros, i.e. p equals 0 0.5, which when we're considering all strings, obviously p is 0 0.5. Um, then well, the expected value of each bit of each successive derivative is 0 0.5. So the the, the, the p of um, the, uh, uh, the if the p of a string is 0 0.5, then as you take successive derivatives, the uh, p persists at 0 0.5, and um, there's no correlation between the individual bits of each successive derivative. And there is no correlation uh, between deri derivatives themselves. And so this gives us a very important property, which is that um, in taking the uh, successive binary derivatives of a string, um, we're essentially executing a small algorithm, um, uh, which, uh, uh, and where the halting problem is relevant. Um, there is, there is, except in certain simple cases, there's no shortcut to actually taking all the binary derivatives. Um, it's the uh, the taking of the binary derivatives is a is a short algorithm uh, which is subject to uh, um, you know the, the, the halting problem. So next slide, next slide, please. So in in designing by entropy, um, we, I had to consider all these factors. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to use Shannon entropy. Um, I'm going to be taking binary derivatives. Uh, I need to use all the binary der derivatives. Um, the derivatives are independent. Um, do I weight, weight the derivatives um, highest first or lowest first? And how do I weight the derivatives? And how do I deal with strings of um, arbitrary length? And you know, we pondered for an hour or two all those various issues and uh, came up with the uh, following uh, uh, um, function. So next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so uh, so by entropy is some function f of the Shannon entropies of all the derivatives uh, of, a, of a string. I it's a weighted average of the binary derivatives of uh, uh, a binary string, and there are the various weighting methods. Um, if anyone's done any time series analysis or read Macrodarchus and Wheelwright, then uh, um, it's pretty obvious that. Uh, uh, excuse me. Do you mean it's a weighted average of the Shannon entropies of the binary derivatives? Uh, correct. Yeah, it's a it's a weighted average of the um, Shannon entropies of the binary derivatives. Yeah, well spotted. There's a couple, a couple of words missing there. Though. It's a weighted average of the Shannon entropy of the binary derivatives. Um, so the, the the weighting method that I use here is uh, quadratic. Uh, but uh, in other recent work, um, I have used the uh, exponential weighting. The reason I use the quadratic weighting, uh, I assigning a, a power of two to each of the different derivatives, is to 
numerically separate the influence of uh, each of the uh, each of the deriv derivatives. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, so there it is in all its glory. Um, so looking at the um, right, uh, it's a sum uh, from k equals naught to k to um, n minus two uh, i for or, or n minus two derivatives of the Shannon entropies of the uh, uh, binary derivatives, and the term at the left uh, just makes the, uh, uh, the summation uh, run between zero and uh, and one. Uh, so by entropy is a hierarchical quadratic weighted average of the Shannon entropies of the binary string and its first n minus two binary derivatives. And I believe I've managed to spell hierarchical correct this uh, this year. Okay, so next next slide, please. So here's a, a simple um, spreadsheet uh, to um, show how we calculate the by entropy of a four bit string. Um, I made a point of doing all the computations and analysis inside the spreadsheet environment, so that in principle, the work is accessible to anyone who's got the uh, ability to you know, use a spreadsheet. Um, and I think that's working quite well for me, which I'll explain later. So you can see for a four bit string, we've got uh, uh, two uh, derivatives. Um, and you can see how we can cal cal calculate the, the uh, by entropy by adding up the number of uh, ones, the number of Bits in the in, in the string for each derivative, and then we've calculated the p, the one minus p, the two logarithms, added them together, and then multiplied multiplied them by a quadratic weighting, and then summed uh, them and take, taken the average. So you can see that string one zero one one has a uh, by entropy of 0 0.5, 0 0.95, so it's a um, it, it's a disordered string. Um, and of course, the computation for a 32 bit or million, million bit uh, numbers is, is exactly the same. Um, and the matrix of deriv derivatives uh, gets larger, but uh, only quadratically. And that's an important point. So, uh, if we move to the next slide, please. So, here's the by entropy of, these, of the four bit strings um, expressed graphically. Uh, so in the bottom right hand corner of the diagram you can see the four by four matrix of uh, each of the 16 numbers between 0 and 15 and you can see half of them have a by entropy of 0.95 you can see a diagonal uh, where the by entropy is low either 0 or 0.14 and two off uh, <coughs> two cross cross diagonals were uh, there's a mid ranging uh, by entropy uh, so um, there's, there's a, if we now look at the next slide, uh, I believe we go straight into the uh, eight-bit strings. Uh, you can see the, um, uh, the the fractal nature of this uh, of this type of diagram. So um, here we have um, you, you can see quite clearly that there are um, the by entropy is low uh, for all the entries on the diagonal. Uh, you can see that there's, there are some interesting cross diagonals that are shorter and run in the uh, orthogonal direction to uh, the main diagonal. Uh, you can see half of the numbers, half of numbers uh, less than 256 uh, have a high by entropy, um, a few have a very low by entropy and some have a, a by entropy in between. And so we're able to rank the uh, 256 numbers between 0 and 255 um, in terms of their relative in terms of the relative order and disorder of their uh, uh, binary digits. And John Anderson pointed out that there are 256 factorial ways of doing that ordering, uh, which is 10 to the power of uh, 508. So, um, an interesting, uh, interesting little statistic there. And so the next slide, please. So, um, the, the by entropy work uh, thus far has been cited uh, about a dozen times um, and its most important citation is inside a, a US government uh, patent which was uh, released a, a couple of years ago uh, by the US uh, Sandia Labs which is a uh, Department of Defense organization so um, a, a guy called Ryan Hilinski uh, 
re-implemented and retested by Entropy and put it on Git, GitHub um, for people to access and use. So, so the algorithm itself has gone through a, a pre-formal pre uh, re-implementation and testing process that's, that's independent of, of myself. And so bizarrely, even, even though it's my own algorithm, uh, I gain confidence from the fact that uh, somebody else has uh, um, you know, re-implemented and, and retested uh, the thing. So, so um, let's go on to our, any, any questions so far? Okay. Um, so it was uh, Christmas before last um, that I found an hour to go and colour in the original diagram with the purple bits uh, which correspond to the prime numbers um, and you can see that uh, most of the prime numbers are, are found in, in the red part of this diagram uh, there's only one prime that's on the uh, diagonal uh, can, anyone, can anyone read what um, number corresponds to the prime number that's on the diagonal, which number is it? Can anyone spot that from the? I don't, I don't know if the diagram's big enough on your screens. But yeah, that, that, the, 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 purple, the purple number that's on the diagonal is in fact uh, um, 17, which is a Fermat prime. Uh, so it took an hour, hour to do that diagram, and then I tabulated the results. Uh, you mean when you talk about prime numbers that you're representing, uh, you're talking about which binary strings represent a prime number as a bi in binary? Um, I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking at the bi-entropy of the prime numbers less than 256. Uh, so um, I, I'm, I'm just doing a, a, this piece of analysis on numbers, numbers that are less than 256. But the interesting thing is that uh, uh, every, every binary number of whatever length uh, can be differentiated down to a uh, two five six uh, to, to an eight bit number, uh, and that's an important uh, property. So now tab now tabulate the results uh, on the next slide. Uh, you can so you can see that the um, the numbers in white uh, on the diagonal uh, there are thirty two of those and only one of them is prime, corresponding to seventeen. There are 32 numbers that are yellow, uh, where the boundary is less than 0.25, greater than 0.15, and there's only one of those that's prime. Uh, orange, there are 15 prime numbers amongst the 64 orange uh, things, and there are 37 uh, prime numbers amongst the uh, 128 uh, in those two red areas. So the prime density uh, varies uh, considerably uh, according to uh, by entropy and uh, the second table I tabulate the uh, by entropy according to the type uh, number whether it's prime not a prime whether it's odd whether it's a mesen prime or whether it's a twin prime and the, um, the significance of the difference between these um, segments uh, in, in the first um, simple analysis uh, this significance was uh, less p less than 0.01 and in the second analysis the p value leaps to uh, uh, less than one in ten one in ten thousand so uh, as I was sitting there uh, having done this very very simple piece of analysis um, uh, I suddenly realized that um, the p values of this order um, I'm looking at a very very important uh, thing and of course, of course um, other than being very good at colouring in and doing the test of two proportions, I had no idea of what was yet to come. And what, so what, what follows was um, I, uh, I, I, I found it akin to trying to climb, up, climb a mountain by uh, pulling on my bootstraps. Um, right, right in the paper that came with analysis uh, was very hard work and took a long, long time. So the first thing I did was, uh, for the numbers less than 256, uh, I tabulated the, uh, by, uh, the I, I plotted them according to their bi-entropy. And I plotted them, uh, I, I plotted the prime density according to the natural uh, order, and I plotted the prime density according to the bi-entropic order. And so the, the blue lines uh, is a smooth uh, natural logarithm curve, 
uh, because the prime number theory tells us uh, the primes are uh, the prime density is uh, according to uh, the natural logarithm of x, uh, or in, more correctly, what is known as the logarithm integrand of x. Um, I use log x and li x as the known interchangeably. Uh, and uh, the red line and the green line show the bi-entropy of the prime. By uh, the red line and the green line shows the uh, prime density. Um, uh, the biotropic prime density, and as you can see, the uh, green line fits uh, uh, very closely a quadratic curve. And this was a surprise, uh, particularly the closeness of fit uh, between the uh, uh, biotropic prime density and the quadratic. Uh, so, uh, if we can have the next slide. So, this is the error graph showing the uh, differences between uh, the two pairs of curves on the previous slide and you can see the mean error is approximately zero and the variation is only between plus or minus uh, 2.5 and it's approximately normal and of course I'm, I'm only doing this with the numbers less than 256 so what I'm, what I'm showing is that there's a very small uh, variation uh, between prime density uh, uh, between the biotropic prime density and um, a quadratic curve uh, and although I didn't understand it at the time it seemed to me that the coincidence of those two curves was was very very important it seems that the error between the um, biotropic prime density and the quadratic prime density influenced the or determined the error between the natural prime density and the natural logarithm uh, and in fact uh, this is this is the case what the, the one does influence the other and we can show and show you why towards the end so next uh, next slide so um i, I decided to go and uh, use a, do a spreadsheet based monte carlo and i generated a, a ten thousand sample of 32 bit uh, uh, binary numbers um, and using a, a, a almost comical um, simple trial division process, uh, I de determined whether or not each of those 32-bit uh, numbers was uh, either prime or not prime. Uh, and I computed the, what I call the P10 by, by entropy, which is the uh, where I take the tenth power of the um, Shannon entropy. Then I was able to sort the uh, those ten thousand numbers into two different orders. Um, the first was the natural order, where the numbers are in the uh, natural uh, sequence um, uh, n n plus one, n plus two, n plus three, and uh, the, the other order, which is the biotropic order, which is where I re reorder those thirty-two bit numbers uh, into the biotropic order. And then I plotted the prime densities for those two differing. Uh, uh, two differing uh, sort orders, and I fitted a quadratic curve to the difference. So we now see those results on the next slide, please. Um, so the, the difference between the two orderings might not look much, um, but when we look at the difference on the next slide, uh, we, we find that the uh, in that 10,000 sample. Uh, of 32-bit numbers, essentially the same property is being observed, uh, which is that uh, by entropy gives a quadratic uh, nature to the um, uh, to the prime density. Uh, I, was, I was also able to, as a, as a way of testing the Monte Carlo simulation, uh, I was able to calculate in advance the um, uh, expected. Uh, distribution of primes, and I was able to find that the uh, biotropic uh, bi prime density bore a certain relationship, an expected relationship to the uh, natural uh, prime density as a way of testing the Monte Carlo. Uh, so that was uh, uh, that's quite a slow spreadsheet, but, but it, uh, uh, 
it, it showed that the property of the side observed in the 8-bit numbers was essentially observed also in the 32-bit numbers. Um, I, I did some work in C uh, on the 300-bit numbers and also got the same results, but the result, results weren't of sufficient quality to, to report them, so, so I didn't. Uh, but I didn't need to report them because I was able to do a piece of theory which uh, supported uh, what I'd empirically discovered. And so the next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so there's there's a difference between uh, the um, actual actual and expect uh, the, the difference between the two prime den prime densities um, broadly broadly normal uh, with a mean mean of zero. So, so in fact, look, look at the if you look at that graph uh, in, in in detail, no, notice it's it's its mean is broadly zero, and the spread. Um, if it's a normal curve, um, we uh, it goes as far, far as 18 on the right and 18 on the left. So a third of 18 is six. So the standard deviation of the error is uh, is only six. So the quadratic um, so the biotropic prime density differs from a quadratic uh, by only six. Uh, for every point on that uh, curve, which is of ten thousand points, so the, the the error is is already quite small, and we're only looking at uh, thirty two bit numbers at the moment. So next slide, please. Um, I didn't look forward to doing this because I knew it was going to be hard, and it was hard um, uh, uh, because we know that uh, all primes are of the form. 6k plus or minus one. Uh, I was going to have to do trientropy. Uh, I've never done uh, trientropic work. Um, it, it, um, my computer is a binary computer. Um, I'm trying to get a binary computer to do trian trinary arithmetic, I knew it was going to be uh, uh, involved me doing some actual work. Uh, so uh, I, the, the most important thing was that I needed a trinary equivalent of the exclusive all function. And uh, uh, I got a little, a little assistance from uh, John Amston on this. Um, so I developed what's known as a, 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 a per one. I, I, I called it um, trinary exclusive or, but John told me that it, it, was, it was what's known as a per-wise per -wise difference table. So I think we've got that on the next slide. Well, it's difficult to see, but um, there are 27, the, the, the trinary, trinary function has three. Uh, inputs A, B, C, uh, one output, and uh, the um, there are 27 uh, rows in the table uh, corresponding to each of the uh, 27 possible combinations of uh, trinary imp input. And you, know, you can't, you probably can't see it. The the actual trientropy output on the right, on the final column at the right, does look a bit dull. All but all but three, all but three of the entries are 0.395. And, uh, Excuse me. Uh, could you give us the definition of trientropy? I'm going to do that. I'm just. I'm just. I'm just introducing some. At the moment, I'm just introducing introducing trinary uh, trinary oh. arithmetic. Oh, okay. So, so I need. I need to. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. So the, the, obviously, to do trientropy, um, I've got to move, move my arithmetic base to trinary, and so uh, a trinary number that comprises. Um, Bits that have uh, trips that have three states: zero, one, and two. And for each of the three state, for each of the twenty-seven states, uh, I need to um, have an output that does something useful. And so I dealt this pairwise trinary difference table. Then this goes into the uh, computation of trientropy, which I think starts on the next slide. Uh, there, there we go. Uh, um, did, did we miss one slide there, Mark? Uh, possibly back one. There, there, there we go. So, <clears throat> the, the, I had I had noticed um, that biometry didn't detect periodicities periodicities of three. Um, so the binary number zero zero one zero zero one zero zero one, um, which is periodic, um, has a high biometry. Uh, indicating disorder, but 
it is in fact a, a periodic number. So, um, yeah. yeah, so if we can move forward because I think I've covered some of that already and forward to the next one. There we go. So here's the uh, tri-entropy computation. Um, so the um, we have a, a nine trit number, and we consume two bits, uh, two trits to compute. We consume three trits to compute uh, each output trit. Um, yeah. For, um, so. Uh, the total number of derivatives in, in, in a triangular computation is, is much is much lower, uh, and the, you can see how the rest of the triangular computation um, follows. It's similar to the bientropy. Um, there are some subtle uh, differences. Go ahead. So th this time to test triangular, I. Uh, computed the tri-entropy of all the numbers uh, less than three to the power of nine. So that's about uh, 16,000 numbers. And there you can see the plot of the uh, uh, natural uh, prime density and the tri-entropic prime density. And again, a small, apparently small difference, but if we plot, plot the difference on the next, uh, on the next graph, um, that's a real humdinger. But, you know, speaking as an engineer, that's a real um, humdinger of a curve fit. So you've got all um, <coughs> you've got all, all um, you've got all sixteen thousand of the or original integers um, uh, fitting a very very tight curve. Um, you know, you, uh, I, uh, I wasn't that enthusiastic about what triantropy might do. But uh, it certainly did the uh, did the business, and we can see that, that on the uh, on the error graph which follows. Thanks, Mark. Uh, uh, I think I missed that error graph out. Anyway, the, the the next thing I needed to do was look at the relationship between bientropy and trientropy for, for the smaller numbers less than two five six. Uh, so I divided the two hundred fifty six numbers. Uh, into two into sixteen co cohorts, cohorts two ways. Uh, so uh, it, it, I allocated a number, a segment number between zero and fifteen, depending upon its bientropy, and I also allocated each number less than fifty six, a cohort number between zero and fifteen, based on its trientropy. Uh, so um, so the fifteen numbers with the lowest bientropy were in by entropy cohort zero, and the 16 numbers with the lowest tri-entropy were in the tri-entropy cohort zero. And so I plotted in red and blue. In red, I plotted the numbers that are divisible by six, and in blue, I plotted the numbers that are prime. And you can see that um, well, we, our, our prior expectation is that numbers with higher bientropy and higher trientropy uh, would most likely be, be prime, and you can see that is what is the case because they sit in the bottom right-hand corner, and the numbers divisible by six sit in the top left-hand corner. So the uh, significance of the two separations is given at the bottom uh, with. with P values that are probably order of uh, uh, one in 500 or one in 10,000. Uh, so, again, uh, so, so we can use bientropy and trientropy together to sharpen our abilities to find primes or, cons or, or, or composites um, based on uh, th these uh, bientropic and trientropic uh, quantities. Uh, that, was quite, that was quite a fun diagram to do that one. Um, in the supplementary materials, which is available online, there are some, some supporting versions of that diagram, uh, which show uh, answer questions about what you know, what about the rest of the numbers, um, and you can see quite plainly that the rest of the numbers that aren't six or prime um, sit uniformly uh, in the uh, 
16 by 16 space that uh, you're looking at now. So um, next slide, please. So we, we can add by entropy and try entropy together uh, and uh, plot their uh, uh, and, and, and plot their prime densities. Uh, so you can see that uh, uh, the, the x-axis is 16,000 points long, uh, and you can see there are just under 2,000 uh, primes, less than 16,000. And you can see um, I, I plotted the first thousand numbers. Uh, the, the first 4,000 numbers, the first 8,000 numbers, the first 12,000 numbers, the first 16,000 numbers. And uh, e each curve is perfectly smooth uh, and, and it intersects the uh, nat natural logarithm as it must um, for, for 8,000, 12,000, 16,000. So, so what, I'm, what I'm saying in this diagram is that uh, not only can we add bi-entropy and tri-entropy together, uh, but when we sort the natural numbers into the tri-bi-entropic tri order, uh, they sort perfectly uh, with, no, uh, uh, with no deviation from the um, expectation. And the expe expectation is based on the properties of the binary and trinary derivatives that uh, we've used in the computation. So essentially, we get, we're getting the prime numbers under uh, under control and starting to understand what uh, what makes them tick. And so the next slide, please. Yep. So um, so we we can sort the number line from here to infinity into ascending order uh, using bi entropy, tri entropy, the combination, and uh, any obvious uh, and the implication is that uh, in higher bases the same that the same thing would happen. Uh, so the, um, the prime density fits a, a quadratic or cubic very tightly, and uh, the the error is uh, very small. And so that, that's where I uh, need a, a theory of, uh, of periodic numbers, because uh, the, the, this, although it's obvious, it would seem obvious that empirical work would generalise. Um, we need to understand the theory as to why it uh, as to why it would. Uh, so, any questions so far? I can go back to normal view now, Mark. Thanks. Any questions, anybody? Brilliant. Thank you, Granville. That's, that's absolutely fascinating. So, um, yeah, questions. Um, hang on, let's see if I can actually everybody on the screen. And move that over. So, I have, I have a sticky hand up on the right hand. Lou? Uh, what do you mean by periodic numbers? Is that the right way around? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll hold it up for a longer period of time. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, it. Uh, Mark is Mark's image is up and yours uh -huh. is down. I can't yeah, read so, it. So uh, I, I've already got a short. Uh, I've got a short. Oh, there. Um, which where where I go where I go through um, properties of periodic numbers. <laughs> What does LEN stand for? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, but I, so a, 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 a periodic number, uh, AB. Um, Meaning a binary string. A, a binary string or, or a binary string A, binary string B, uh, where the length of A and the length of B uh, is equal to N. Uh, it, the string is periodic if A equals B. Um, and I'm dealing, dealing with strings where the length is greater than or equal equal to one. Um, there's also what's could, known as- could you, could you explain again what that has to do with primes? Yeah, I'm just about to do that now. Oh, so okay. I've got, I've, I'm I've, sorry. I've, sure. I've, I've got a short, uh, the, the next bit of the presentation is um, follows uh, using these uh, bits of paper. Uh, is that right, right, right way around? Or was that the wrong way, wrong way around? I see. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. Can you read that? Yeah, fine. No, lift it up a bit. Can you lift, lift it up it? a bit? Yes. Yeah. Not. No, you're too close to the too close to the camera. Go. That's it. Perfect. Too far. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So, per periodic numbers in any base uh, cannot be prime, with uh, two important exceptions, and so. Um, 
reading my, uh, so we've got a, 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 m to the power of n multiplied by a uh, plus b. Um, so that, 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 that's what a, a periodic number looks like. Uh, and so we do a simple substitution and uh, we, we, can, we can prove uh, that uh, a periodic number cannot be prime in any base. And you know, the, the, the proof is just three or four lines long. Okay. And the, the, two, the two exceptions um, are, are the prime numbers themselves. So every, every prime greater than, uh, greater, greater than two is of the form one, one. So 23, uh, the prime number 23 is one, one in base 22. So every prime is a periodic number. And there's a second exception, which are the uh, Fermat numbers, uh, of which there are only f five known. Um, and John Bocklin and Conway, as in John Conway, uh, did an interesting paper which uh, shows that uh, whereas uh, there might be a few more, you're probably not going to find them. Uh, so that, 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 those are the two exceptions. Uh, so the, the, the rule is that uh, if a number's periodic in any base, it uh, can't be prime. And Shannon, Shannon entry, Entropy uh, picks this up. Uh, so for every derivative, um, if the derivative is all zeros or all ones, then uh, Shannon entropy goes goes to zero. So because we're doing this for all the binary derivatives, uh, we know that um, a, a low by entropy uh, uh, means a, a low probability finality. So the Number of derivative number of derivatives is uh, of the order of um, n is n squared over two. So here I've got a, a binary string of uh, length eight. Um, so the number of um, binary derivatives is uh, eight squared equals sixty four uh, divided by two is thirty is thirty two. Um, I think I might, might, might have missed a term off the end there. I, I might, might, might have missed. Um, uh, a minus n off the end, uh, but it's of the order of uh, n squared over two. And so, because the number of binary derivatives uh, is fixed for any n, um, we can deduce some pretty si uh, some simple but potent statistical properties of um, the um, bi, bi entropy curve from that. I probably haven't explained this as well as I ought to have done in my paper, but uh, there's time yet. And so, so we, we, we use the um, properties of the um, binary, because we know the number of binary derivatives, um, we know the magnitude of the error in these two curves, uh, which I showed you in the um, spreadsheet format uh, earlier. So just to remind you that the error between the natural and logarithmic prime density and the biantropic and quadratic prime density um, are constant and, and normal. Um, that's because the um, because the quadratic curve is a central measure and the natural logarithm is a proven central measure. Uh, we know that in computing the X bar and the differences to compute the variances of these various terms, um, we, 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 can say, we can say this. Uh, so the, uh, the um, A and B, um, A is the limit as X goes to infinity of the difference between of the variance of the difference between the bientropy of a number and its uh, quadratic, uh, the variance of the difference goes to goes to zero as X, as X goes to infinity, and 
because x bar for A and x bar for B are both zero because they are central measures. I've shown you the uh, data clustered around the um, zero. Uh, we, we, so we know from the, we, we know from the distribution of the error in the bientropy quadratic uh, because x bar for A and x bar for B are the same. Uh, the limit of the variance of, as x goes to infinity uh, of, of the difference between the um, pi x and li x uh, also goes to zero. And so this knocks into a cocked hat the um, limit uh, that von, Co von Koch came up with in uh, 1901, which was that the uh, the, the Riemann hypothesis is proven if the uh, error between pi x and li x is uh, less than uh, root x. So uh, the variance of the difference between pi x and li x tends to zero at, at an infinitely tighter bound than the bound proven, than, uh, proven by von Koch in 1901. And so there you have it. Um, that's, that's the, uh, that's it, I'm afraid. <laughs> Sydney. Yeah, I just have two questions. Um, the first question is, um, these interesting properties of bientropic derivatives and stuff, um, does that come about because the binary derivative and these derivatives of, um, are basically discrete versus continuous? That's my first question. And my second question is, does any of this, um, do any of your, uh, do, does this have any results for maximizing or optimizing circuitry that might be good for, you know, like, um, example, fast adders or something like that? Does it help the circuitry? Would your research help that, optimize that? Uh, That's it. it did, yeah, I, I, I get the gist of uh, both sides of your question. Thanks, uh, Sydney. Um, yeah. So the first, the, the first one, the, um, the there are a, a discrete there are a discrete number of uh, binary derivatives for uh, an, any number of uh, length n. Uh, let's assume that n's even. So uh, the, the number of deriv binary derivatives is, is order of, uh, of the order of n squared over, over two, and uh, that that puts strict constri strict constraints on the any variation that can be, be seen in the frequency of uh, of primes. Um, because uh, the, 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 there are a couple of the, the properties of the binary derivative that I talked about first off, um, they, yeah, the, the, a, a number, yes, let me, let me recall a number is uh, a number is a number is periodic if and only if uh, one of its derivatives is zero. And so if we find in the computation of the derivatives of a binary number that one or more of its derivatives is zero, there's a, a strict probability uh, that that number cannot be prime. Mm. In the same way, that a, a periodic number cannot be prime, excluding the two exceptions. Uh, a, a number may not be prime if one or more of its higher derivatives is zero and, and that and, and that and those that that relationship strict, strictly governs the shape of the biantropic prime density and um, forgive me that that trying trying to find the words or, or even the algebra to make this absolutely plain has been very very difficult but it, it, it's doable and it's just a matter of running through <laughs> time after time after time until I can find the words. And, and second part of, your, part of your question, um, uh, yeah, it's not, it, it's, it's never been known that the patterns in the binary and trinary derivatives um, would influence the ability to detect prime numbers, for example. Um, so there are huge implications in, um, <laughs> in prime number algorithms, uh, random random number generation algorithms uh, and also I think uh, potentially in the design of um, arithmetic um, and floating point circuitry 
um, there are some really useful tricks, I am sure, that could be done. Because when you start combining with the properties of uh, binary and trinary derivatives with things like the Chinese remainder theorem and Fermat's little theorem, um, of which I only know, but I'm not a, an expert in, uh, I, I suspect there are going to be some, some very interesting uh, uh, related properties that would be a, a, a very high, uh, high utility. Thank you. So, yeah, thanks for listening. Thank you. Anybody? Anybody else? Um, Gre Grenville, can I ask a question? Um, I, I wonder if I can share my screen because I've been playing with, I, I'm also fascinated by Shannon and mm -hmm. I, I find it very useful. And um, uh, with um, a sociologist called Leidersdorf, we were playing with a little program that just literally calculated the entropy of a string as you typed it in. Can you see that? Yeah. Um, yeah. And we were particularly interested in, in some of the other Shannon calculations like mutual information and, and uh, there are some very strange things that uh, Shannon, Shannon's equation throws up every now and then. Um, yeah. But my question is that the, the Shannon formula is really about measuring the, um, or, or summing the, 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 basically the probability times the log of the probability base two across an alphabet of different symbols. Yeah, and and, it's, and you've, it's, got, you've got two symbols. Yeah. So what happens when we have more symbols? Can we, is this useful? Because I mean, it's extrapolating what you seem to be looking for, you're looking for pattern. And That's right, so yeah. if we're looking for pattern. Well, well his first we, step out was trinary. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Think, okay. Yeah. yeah. And so, so, and so we could uh, we we could do a version of bientropy where we looked at uh, 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 four bit four bit strings. So the, uh, the the unit instead of the unit instead of the unit of measure being one bit um, yeah. and binary, we could have a, a binary string where the uh, unit of measure was four bits and yeah. uh, there were sixteen states. Um, and that, that's just on a long long list of things to do. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so this is very interesting. Now, I, I want to I want to throw in something else here because this is something that um, Lot Leidersdorf and I were, were puzzling over, which is um, one of the um, important calculations in information theory, as you know, is is mutual information, which is the relative value or the relative the relationship between the entropy of one string and the entropy of another string. Uh -huh. um, and something weird happens because the uh, under certain circumstances you get negative numbers as, <laughs> as the value of mutual information and I, I wonder if what you're doing might throw some light on this because uh, so if I don't know if I can reproduce this now so if I have um, a string and, and yeah. just, just some stuff in there and I have another string with just Lots of, oh no, I can't actually remember what we did. Mm. I'll have to write, I'll write to you about this. Yeah, um, but sure. Basically, this, this mutual information value should be positive, And every now and then it goes negative. Okay. Um, I, think that ha I think that happens in um, Steve Pincus's uh, cross, uh, cross entropy, which he's, he's done a, a, it's not the same as bi-entropy, but it's, it's um, uh, a, Randomness measure for real uh, for real strings, and yeah. um, I, I think the uh, negative negative cross entropy is seen there. So uh, um, I, I, it doesn't surprise me. Um, one 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 thing that brings to mind though is that, um, uh, one of the things you can use shadow entropy for is computing the uh, ability or otherwise to, to recover signals from noisy channels. Yes, absolutely. And, yes, and so. Um, one of the th things on the list of things to do f for me, uh, but I'll never get around to it, is the s to see to what extent the uh, uh, to what extent by entropy improves or, all about, or, or or doesn't improve the ability ex to extract uh, uh, strings from noisy channels uh, because missing out the uh, entropy of the higher derivatives um, seems to be a. Um, uh, I wonder how that reconciles to the rest of Shannon's theory because of course his, his original paper was quite, was quite long and quite thorough and you know how does this emission of periodicity uh, play out uh, when we review uh, Shannon's uh, mathematics. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think th this is important stuff. And I remember um, one of the uh, attendees at the um, conference last year had quite a lot of experience in machine learning. And he was saying, you know, actually, this is really important for the way that we're encoding stuff in machine learning. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you, like the, do you like the bit about the halting problem where you've got to go and actually uh, compute the derivatives? There's no, there's, there's no way around it. <laughs> right. Because uh, uh, that, 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 that's, um, that, that, that implies quite, quite, a, quite a lot, I believe. Hmm. Okay. Anybody else? Any questions? Well, I, I have something I, I just uh, like to add. Uh, um, some time ago, I wrote a uh, paper on symbolic computation, trying to understand uh, arithmetic in terms of Boolean operations. And uh, maybe uh, as a suggestion, perhaps you can uh, go to the dyadic integers or uh, triadic integers or piadics in general and compute the entropies that way. So you could take uh, in the dyadics, one third exists as a binary sequence going from right to left, and you can take the lim inf of the entropies. That mm -hmm. function might be very useful. It might pull out a lot more information. So the reciprocal of the numbers would be important. You can't work with the even numbers if you use the dyadics, but for the odd numbers, it would tell, give you a lot of information. Um, okay, perhaps be kind enough just to summarize that and, and, pick, uh, and email me. Um, uh, uh, sure. Uh, yeah. Can, uh, well, I don't have your email address. I'll give you mine and I'll give you the link to my paper. Here's the link to the paper and here's my email address. Okay, I'll pick those up, yeah. Right. I, uh, I haven't um, basically, uh, um, whoops. Uh, you raised a lot, I was interested in factoring and um, um, we need to talk sometimes. I think uh, there's some interesting uh, possibilities on uh, the factorization problem too. Yeah, I, 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 I tried to uh, I bet I have a policy of not, me not mentioning that. <laughs> oh yeah. yes, gotta be careful. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed yeah. your I enjoyed your talk very much. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. Nice. so I mean, we're, we're, uh, yeah, I think this, if we evaluate a number using bi entropy or m entropy, um, it's obviously very quick to do a cursory uh, examination of a number, and then you can uh, have a look at, uh, in the m space of all the metrics that you've computed. Um, maybe you can gain some information about the properties of, uh, of, of factors, uh, right. which I think would be. Uh, and I think the AK, uh, I think the, um, the relationship of this work with the AKS algorithm. Uh, is pretty important too, uh, right. but I, I, I'm, yours, yours truly is a, is a computer scientist. That's, that's how I was trained. I'm not a mathematician, but uh, I think the point I was making about the um, halting problem is that there's an element of computation, there's, uh, there's an element of algorithmic in this piece of work, which is you know, why I came to do it. But I think we need, people, need to take other aspects of it forward. We need people with uh, deep mathematical ability to. Uh, um, you know, take what I've done and do something with it. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, any more questions? Yes, Peter. Uh, if we go, you're using a concept of entropy, which is really comes from physics. Uh, it seems to me that. Uh, that what you've just told us uh, really corresponds with the fact that uh, the uh, fermions correspond to the Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, yeah, there, uh, uh, that, that's another large piece of work. Um, there's, there's, there's a very, there's, because of the strong relationship between the quadratic and the, log, and the logarithm uh, over the primes, um, the, there's a there's a close relationship between bi entropy and Boltzmann's entropy, mm. um, and so I think there's a close connection with physics. Um, uh, but again, that's not my not my strong point. But I've got, I, I've seen a few papers where uh, 
there's a strong correspondence between what we've done and uh, what pe other people have done in the physics domain. Perhaps uh, Peter Rollins could comment. Peter? Uh, You're muted. <laughs> um, well, it's very likely that there is such a correlation. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure the primes are, play, are going to play a, a big, significant element in in their physics, and uh, in some time in the future. But we haven't got those exact correlations yet, so we're waiting to to see what, when they come up. I'm sure there is a correlation, a deep correlation, just as uh, people think there's a correlation between the uh, fermions and uh, Riemann zeta function. Mm. Oh, oh, yes. Well, I mean, the, the, the opposite to uh, yeah. fermions are bosons, and uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the bosons seem, seem in, uh, in the uh, theory that Peter's interested in to, uh, to uh, correspond to a nil potent. Fermions do. Fermions are nil potent. The fermions are nil potent. Yeah, fermions. Oh, both yeah, but, are just uh, scalar functions. Yeah. But so the so the error in the prime distribution is nil, is nil potent, isn't it? Because it's symmet it's symmetric, uh, normally distributed, and uh, and uh, and as smooth as uh, as you want to, as you want to make it. Mm. So mm. It, uh, have you thought of uh, correlating this with the theory of cellular automata? The theory of cellular automata, because you know, the, oh, the, uh, the, yeah. the adjacent squares connect in that. Uh, yeah, the um, I, I have had a look and uh, and yeah, I've seen some work by John Anson with his colleague. Uh, uh, he's, he's got a colleague who's doing the computation for him, and uh, yeah, the, 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 there are some overwhelming correspondences. Um, but I, I, I need to totally upgrade my um. Comp computation, both software and harder hardware, to you know, grasp what's going on. So, yeah, yeah, it's a good suggestion. That thanks for reminding me. Uh, yeah, cellular automata. Yeah, the um, yeah, the the the, um, the exclusive or function corresponds to one of uh, Wolfram's. Uh, number uh, algorithms can't remember which one it is um and another of the biotropic related concepts corresponds with the sierpinski gasket which is another of uh, uh wolfram's numbered um cas yeah uh, could you send uh, to the ampa chat the copies of uh, the papers you've written so far on this um, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, or, or just Google by entropy. Um, that's uh, well, um, but I'll, uh -huh. I'll, I'll, I'll happily send them. Great. Uh, John has got his hand up. Yeah, um, this may sound like an off the wall question, but um, and it really only makes sense uh, after I talk tomorrow, but I'll try and make sense of what I'm about to ask. There is a principle in biology called terminal addition. So the fact that, you know, arms are attached to fingers, that kind of thing. Um, there is the periodicity to that, and it relates to epigenetic inheritance, which we don't understand the mechanism for yet. But I, I'm wondering, as I'm listening to your talk, whether the mathematics of that would answer the, would, would be the solution to the question that we're asking about the basics, the basics of terminal addition. How does biology know to add stuff. And well, for, I, I wrote a paper on terminal addition saying that if it's all about cellular communication, it really is not too um, efficient to stick stuff at the beginning because then you're uh, obfuscating the whole evolutionary principle. And in the middle, that doesn't work either. So of course, it has stuff has to get added to the end, but that's totally a rationalization. But mathematically, maybe there is a rationale for that in your mathematics. Yeah, I, I, I've seen uh, the mathematics of uh, the mathematics of Casio Kondo, uh, which relates to biological structures. Um, there is a um, 
there's a connection there between the properties of basic numbers, you know, the, the lower numbers and uh, biological form. And so um, I'm sure there's a um, you know, the, the simple property that uh, periodic numbers can't be prime um, might influence uh, biological structure as, well, it, as it must. We know we know epigenetically that the way the way that data are collected in the environment to influence the adaptational process occurs in the egg and the sperm. And that biochemically there is, uh, the DNA is modified biochemically, but there must, I would, I would pro I'm proposing that there's a mathematical algorithm that would answer that, that question, how the genome knows where to stick the, their, their um, mm -hmm. biochemical modifications of DNA that change the readout. It's a methylation or ubiquitination. But I'm saying that mathematically, they're, they're, I would submit that there probably is some mathematics that would explain that. Yeah, I, 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 would, t I would tend to agree. Not my field, but uh, um, yeah, we'll uh, the, 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 there are some deep, uh, deep connections between these fields. Okay, fair enough. Well, that may be a good point to say. John, you're talking tomorrow. Oh, <laughs> what are you going to talk about? Um, I haven't quite decided. No, I, 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 I have to apologize. I'm using traditional PowerPoint. I can't do that Bob Dylan thing with the, you know, with the notes, handwritten notes. So yeah, so I'm going to talk. The fundamental point I'm going to make is that we think about, I'm going to talk about cellular evolution. Basically, Darwinian evolution is backwards. So we think about everything from its ends instead of its means. And I've de uh, developed a whole theory based upon 100 plus peer reviewed articles and six, now seven books about how you can start from the beginning of evolution at the unicellular state and move forward, which provides the logic. So that's basically what I'm talking about. Great, okay. So um, Grenville, thank you very much. It's been really fascinating. And um, thank you. I, I, I found, you know, I'm also going to mention um, entropy in, in work that I'm going to talk about. And uh, it's, it's just so fascinating to see these patterns. It's the patterns that you're picking up, which are, are extraordinary, I think. So, thank you. Hey, can you give us the reference to the Casio Condo? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Email it me, it's okay. Just email it me when you've, when you've got it, if you can. Yeah, we'll do. Or maybe, it's, it's maybe a, if I just look on the archive. It's on archive. It's probably on the archive. Yeah, it's yeah. on the archive. I'll, if I can't find it on the archive, I'll get back to you. Yeah, okay. just. Mark, can I just ask, so Mark, you were talking about the entropies creating negative entropy. I mean, that is, is the mutual information. Yeah, so does that, does that by any chance relate to Schrodinger, um, uh, Schrodinger's ne negative entropy? Is that a um, mathematical? It's um, okay. So that there's a long there's a long history of this, and it goes back to the work of Ross Ashby and then Klaus Krippendorf. Lou knows about this stuff. Klaus Krippendorf has done a lot of work on this about um, mutual information, particularly in three where you've got three interacting entities um, transmitting in, uh, information between them, and um, there's there's a, a sort of um, there's a question as to why the mutual information becomes negative and what it means. Well, as I um, said, I mean, you know, in Bohm's terms of implicate and explicate, there was no explicate until there was life, in my opinion. Yeah. And that's, that's contingent upon negative entropy. So are you talking about the same thing I am in the sense that that, that, that um, construct is a consequence of the, the um, merging of two entropies? make a negative entropy? Is that what's going on? Um, I think, okay, so the, the explanation is that there's, um, the mutual information is basically the crossover between sets of uh, the entropies between those sets. So where, where the entropy crosses over now, um, it's, it's, if you can imagine the sort of Venn diagrams and they cross over, um, yeah. there's a sort of, there's a negative image, which yeah. you also have to consider. And when it goes negative, it's, you're looking at that negative image. You're looking at the so space my, between. My hypothesis about the origin of life is 
we know that there were polycyclic hydrocarbons produced by pulsars when immersed in water on Earth, they generated light. So now you have two entropies converging to create negative entropy. Is that the same thing? I don't know. I'd have, I'd have to think about it. Okay. Um, but we, we, yeah, we, well, let, maybe we can, maybe I'll, I'll think about it before your talk tomorrow. I'm saying that the lipids have a certain entropy, the water has a certain entropy. You merge the two, they form micelles. That's the, cons the construct. But, but that's the overlapping of the two entropies to create a negative entropy, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'd, 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 I'll, I'll give it some thought before you talk tomorrow. I think, I, think this is, I think this is very interesting. What I'm saying is if you reverse engineered the formation of a micelle by immersing lipids in water, you would come up mm. with the entropy of water and lipids. So they're, in other words, they can be deconstructed, right? Um, yeah, I've got yeah. to think about it, John. Okay. You've got 24, 24 yeah, hours. Yeah, I've got, I've got 24 hours, no pressure. I'll think about it. Yeah, three think hours. About it. yeah I know. <laughs> Two hours. <laughs> anyway, okay. thank you very much, everybody. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to um, tomorrow's talk and uh, the rest of the week, really, because, uh, yeah, there's, there's more fun to come. Okay, Excellent. so. And great work. Great work, Grenville. Thank you. Yes, no, no, thank you, Grenville. It was really, really, really stimulating, really fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank <laughs> you. Okay, bye-bye, folks. <laughs>